Okay, so Arpin, uh, today we're it's the Friday episode, but we have to record this one on Thursday for let's call it travel reasons. We have uh, issues that would make this impossible for us to record it after the Canucks game. So here we are in advance. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, I'm obviously. I'm dressed to go to the Canucks game. So this is just before the Canadians face the Canucks here in Vancouver. Marc Antoine is in Belleville, Ontario, waiting mm. to cover David Reinbacher's North American professional debut on Friday evening. Um, I hope to be on a plane all day Friday, uh, trying to, because the Canadians canceled their media availability on Friday. So I was booked on a red eye, trying to get on a morning flight. So as you're listening to this, hopefully just leave a thought for me and say, I hope Arpin's in a plane right now. On his way home. Um, well, no, knowing you, I just hope that you just don't yeah, miss the plane. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, 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 <laughs> that's your I signature teed, move. I teed, I teed that one up for you. So, yeah, a lot to talk about regardless. So, regardless of what happens in the Vancouver Canucks game, um, I found it very interesting this morning, and I thought we could kick off the show that, you know, the, the Canucks a year ago, were sort of floundering to the – I mean, they had a strong finish to their season. They had been – had a couple months under Rick Tockett, and I wanted to see this morning if they felt they laid some groundwork down the yeah. stretch last season that permitted this to happen, uh, this incredible season that they've been on all season. So it was interesting because Mike Matheson brought it up Uh, he said yesterday, actually, well, Wednesday, I should say, that all the close games the Canadians are playing, many of them have been losses, have been extremely frustrating, but the fact that they lead the league in one-goal games makes him believe that they could be next season's Vancouver. Now, I think that's a little optimistic. There, you know, there's no, well, I don't know, but there's no, there's no obvious Quinn Hughes ready to, you know, take over and, and go to another level. And there's no Elias Pedersen and Thatcher Demko. And there's all these pieces in Vancouver that Montreal doesn't seem to have. Uh, but I found the thought exercise interesting. So yeah. the Canucks themselves, I'll just share with you. And then I want to get your thoughts, you know, like, so I, I tried looking for this this morning and a lot of them said that as opposed to something that's in their play from last season, That led to this, what last season did for them, and Quinn Hughes said it, like they were angry that this was happening again. And everyone I asked, Brock Besser, Tyler Myers, Rick Tockett himself, said the main indicator for what the Canucks did this season was actually their offseason and how they put 100% of their focus on training camp, on getting off to a good start to the season. And, and that led to this. And It's an interesting premise because I remember the year Placanitz got traded at the deadline. Like he pinned their entire season on their start. And I think more than ever now, the NHL is a league where you have to start well. And if you can, if you could do that, it could take you really far. And it's, it's, it's that slim of a, the parity is that high. And it's just that slim, like, like just a little tiny bit of momentum to start the season, and you can get a season that looks like the Canucks. Yeah, you start you start believing in, in yourself, and the rest uh, the rest follows. It just carries. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. It's it's interesting, and I mean, I'm not going to dispute <laughs> the way that the Canucks feel about themselves. I mean, they've had a an amazing season. If I I understand the Canadians that would like to inspire themselves from what the, Cana uh, the, the Canucks have done. Uh, there are a few differences, though. Last year, uh, Thatcher Demko was either injured or not very good, uh -huh. and he's been stellar this season. So he's one of their main players. Elias uh -huh. Peterson, prior to the arrival of Rick Tuckett behind the bench, was really, really slow to get started. I remember at, at that point there was – Rumors, uh, trade rumors that had started and whatnot. Uh, JT Miller is having a better season this year than last year too. So you have, I would say that, and not to mention Brock Besser, who's really having a different type of season compared to last year too. So apart from Quinn Hughes, the, the core players on that team 
are much uh-huh. better this year than last year. So it it tends to go with this idea that no matter the the acquisitions that they might have made, it's really a matter of making sure that you start the season on time. Uh-huh. The Canadians could do the same, but they, their nucleus is not as good as the Canucks. So there's there's always this situ there, this possibility that you could sure you could get a bump in the, uh, from one season to another. Uh, we see it also with the Philadelphia Flyers this season in the East. You saw it last year with the New Jersey Devils before they faltered and they went back to their old ways basically this year. Uh, uh, injuries played a part too, obviously there. Um, but I think that there is the, the Canadians can can take solace in the fact that yes, they're they're in on close games, they're not that far, and if they find a way in their preparation individually to to bridge that gap little by little, maybe that next year is going to help. But I think that they they need to add because that nucleus is not as good as the Canucks. The Canucks had a great core, but they they were really struggling with their surrounding staff. I think that they got stronger in that de- de- uh, department. But I'm I'm not sure if Suzuki is on par with Peterson, if Matheson's on par with Hughes, if Motambo is on par with Demko. So you look at the best pieces. That's it's it seems optimistic to me a little bit. Yeah, the one interesting thing I agree with you, but the one interesting thing that I find about the Canucks, you know, like their off season, you know, wasn't all that impactful. But the impactful thing to me that they did uh, that they're going to have to deal with this off season was the Ronick deal. And if you remember last year at the deadline the Canucks got absolutely lambasted for that Ronick deal. Like they just mm-hmm. got raked over the coals. Uh, it, it was a nonsensical move for a team that appeared to be not ready to make a trade like that. Um, and he's an RFA this season with our brights are this off season, I should say um, it's, but it, it seems, it seems like it was, uh, we see it to a certain extent, like that they knew something that, uh, that the rest of us didn't. Um, you know, their willingness to 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 throw futures at a at a guy that had a year and change left on his contract just did not seem overly smart. You know, the the Red Wings wind up with Axel Sandin Pelica as a result of that first round pick that they got in that deal. Yeah, it, and it got me thinking, like. The Canadians have made trades like that already. You know, Alex Newhook, Kirby Doc, we don't need to remind everyone of what they've done. But, um, and you don't make deals with that generally at the deadline. That's what was kind of weird about it last season. But this offseason, I just wonder with all the picks the Canadians have, all the prospects they have, if they're just going to go even more. Like, it's not just going to be the one deal in the offseason, but like go after more trades like that. And, and frankly, this season, you know, we always bring it up like, oh, what if Kirby Doc was there? What if Kirby Doc was there? The one thing about Kirby Doc is we don't know. We don't know. Right. We don't know. <laughs> like, we don't know anything. You know, it's, it's he had a very promising looking, you know, 50 something games or whatever he played last season. But there's no guarantee whatsoever that of anything with Kirby Doc of his health, of how he's going to play when healthy you just get the impression that he's an important piece. So until they know that, you can't say for sure. But, you know, when you mentioned, like, Demko was was out or bad last season, like, I think that's Doc, Doc is their Demko, right? Like, we don't really know how impactful he would be. And, mm-hmm. and I just, I wonder if the Canadians see opportunities this offseason, if they're just going to go... Like, like Ronick was their doc like trade, you know, like New Hook. We always said, well, what's the next doc like trade? Like, that's kind of what the Canucks did with Ronick. And I just wonder if, if they do that a couple of times this offseason, if they could turn it around relatively quickly. I think there's a chance for that. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it. And, you know, um, a, a lot of our listeners write to us when we ask for questions on the Monday mailbag. There's a lot of questions about who do you think the Canadians could acquire? in the summer Mm -hmm. and so far voluntarily we have not 
you know, digged well, into it, those que- dug into those questions. Yet, it's uh-huh. not that we think that it's not interesting. I think that there's there's a um, uh, a treasure <laughs> treasure chest there of of interesting hypotheses and interesting questions um, that will, I guess, get to in the future. But theoretically, just to follow on what you're what what, what you're talking about, I think that there's definitely a sense of um, of potentiality not for the Canadians not necessarily to to go ahead of themselves this summer but uh-huh. when every time that i hear can't talk can't use talk or i read an article that where he was quoted there's always the verb accelerate yeah. it's always there accelerate uh-huh. accelerate the rebuild so they want to rebuild but any way shape or form that they can find ways to uh short find shortcuts to make this quicker they will do it and in right. that sense that type of move so using those those first round picks i think that it's it's a given at this point i'd be so surprised if they use all of those first round picks and the next couple of drafts i think that they're going to be used for for more immediate help so you need to strengthen that nucleus because i think that what we've seen so far from the montreal canadians the group that's already here is that those players individually they are getting better the progression that they were on it to see we're seeing it uh-huh. now it's a matter of can we get the the group stronger those pieces are good they're getting better they're all in the right trajectory uh-huh. but do we have enough of that <laughs> uh, getting those players to a better place you know and making sure that all of them reach their full potential will it be enough no it won't the, if you, you need you need more so that's where i think that the difference with the vancouver canucks is that they had those pieces already and now they they were in a position the gap was so big between last season and this year i think it caught everybody by surprise i remember at some point in the season for ah, i would say probably three months we were talking about how it was a PDO fueled team, you know, high, yeah. high, uh, safe percentage, high shooting percentage. And that's eventually it would come back to earth, but they, 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 they went on and acquire Elias Lindholm and sent the message that they were all in for this season. I think it's great. I, th- but I think maybe the Canadians will be buyers at that time next year, but I expect them to be buyers more in the summer. And reevaluate next year, depending on where they are. They might, they might be sellers again at this, uh, at the trade deadline next year. But I feel like we're reaching a point where either this summer or the summer after, uh-huh. they're going to start getting aggressive and they're going to start making sure that they're, they can be competitive. And you look at the rest of the, uh, uh, of the Eastern Conference, you have, sure, you have a chunk of five, six very good teams. But the, there's been such a the mushy middle has been so mushy. <laughs> the, oh God! Yeah, the, it's it's, it's like, almost it's, it's embarrassing. Like no, it's like no one wants to make the playoffs. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, if I'm the if I'm can't use, I'm looking at that and say, you know what? I might I might be far from the level of the Florida Panthers or the New York Rangers at this point, but I'm not. I'm certainly not far from that group of teams. That say to each other, "Hey, do you want our spot? Because uh, we're not sure we want it." Yeah. I think that the Canadians can—they they don't need to do a whole lot to at least, you know, bridge the gap with that that tier of teams. Yeah. For the record, the Canucks continue to lead the NHL in PDO. By the way, just uh, just so you know, at five on five, right. still the case. Uh, hottest <laughs> yeah. shooting hottest shooting team in the league. It's been all year. They shoot at eleven percent as a team. 920, yeah. 924 save percentage at five on five. So, I mean, and that's what you I mean. You have good goal to, and Thatcher Demko is hurt right now. It's Casey the Smith, ironically. That's really, uh, yeah. we're going to get the Casey the Smith versus Tanner Pearson showdown tonight, which will have already happened, obviously, when people are listening to this. But, um, so one thing that struck me there when, when you said, I see them getting really aggressive and next season, this summer or next summer. And I think it's going to be this summer personally. And the one, tantalizing thing thought that came to mind is if you're looking to acquire a player from a rebuilding team 
uh, which the Canadians are, by the way, they're still in that category. Uh, how spicy would it be and how self-assured would you have to be to throw in next season's first round pick? Like next season's Canadians first round pick. Just a total mm-hmm. lottery ticket. Like here you go. Here's count on us being bad. We want play we want player X. We'll give you our pick next year. And so you can gamble on how bad we'll be. Uh yeah, well, it's, it would be top ten protected if it if they did that, no? Yeah, but well well then it would have less value, right? I mean that's the thing, is 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 to get the most value yeah. out of that pick, you gotta leave it with make it top three protected, make it just purely top three mm-hmm. protected and say, here you go. Here's, you know, we'll take that player and it better be a really good player. Like, let's say Trevor Zegris, you know, for instance, like just as an example. Um, and say, you know, we're not going to give you a first pick this year, but we're going to give you this. We're only going to put a top three protection on it. So it could be number four, depending on how bad you think we'll be. And, and build a trade around that. I think that's, I, I would, I would, you know, Pierre Dorian kind of ruined that kind of trade for, for, for the NHL. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know, not putting protection on those picks that he traded away. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a spicy meatball. I think that the Canadians could potentially shop around this summer. Um, if they want to bet on themselves, you know, and, and I don't know if they're, I don't know if they should feel like they're ready to do that, but it's true. Like Trevor Latowski was saying today about, you know, you get into overtime and a shootout, it's basically a coin flip. And I was like, yeah, but you keep losing the coin flip. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, yeah. and well, like you've had incredibly, if you think that, then you've had incredibly a, a run of incredible bad luck in that situation for it to come up tails when you're calling heads seven out of eight times or whatever it's been, you know? So Um, but if you look at all those one goal games, uh, I was actually, I was actually looking at it earlier. Like they have so many losses by one goal, um, yeah. which Bob Ganey famously once said a one goal, a one goal loss means you're two goals away from winning, which I think is actually a good perspective to have, but they've lost in regulation and in overtime and or shootout 23 games by one goal, like by far the most in the league. Like but far and away. And you turn half of those or maybe a third of those into wins, um, which would mean what, six more wins, five or six more wins. Right. And they're suddenly in that mushy middle you were just talking about. You know, they're at 72 points. They're one point behind the Islanders if you had five wins to their total. And it's just like it's so it's it's an interesting, you know, the Canucks create It's kind of like the blues, that of that blues effect that the Canadians were talking about forever. Like, oh, look at what the blues did. We, maybe we can maybe we can do that too. I think there's probably a lot of teams looking at the Canucks and the Flyers particularly and saying, wow, like no one expected them to do that and no one's expecting us to do it. So maybe that could be us next year. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, doubt, no doubt about it. But I mean, it's when it comes to the Flyers, there, it seems even more fluky than the Canucks because – The Canucks have high end talent that mm-hmm. you can think that they, if they've, they've made sure that their top players were at like close to their optimal level or like the, a, a very competitive level. So you look at the Flyers, it's who are these guys? You know, it's yeah. not, can it connect me? Can, wow. Sure, connect me can be Brock Besser. He can. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, there's, There's not a whole lot there that suggests that there is going to be like the same for them to continue that way. It would be, it would be like the way Barry Trotz squeezed every ounce out of some okay teams in Nashville or, or with the Islanders, for example, mm-hmm. you know, for yeah. that to continue to me, there's a, there's really a chance of the, the Flyers coming back to earth, whereas the Vancouver Canucks, You know, I, I, think, I, think, there's a, that I think there's a chance of them coming back to Earth too next season. I don't, I, I, yes, but not to the extent that they would miss the playoffs. You know, I don't. I, I, they, they're going to be. You know, when they're going to come back to Earth in the playoffs? I think that they're prime yeah. candidates to a first round exit. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the team that that miss the playoffs very often, and they need to just gain that mileage in the playoffs. 
And those teams that don't have it, with, no matter how talented they are, when they reach the playoffs, they, they haven't paid their dues in the playoffs. Usually they're, it's a quick exit for them. Yeah. So, so I think that's where it might, it might happen. So, but how to tie this up to the Canadians? <laughs> well, no. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's the, that's the thing. That, and it's, it doesn't only apply to the Canadians. It applies to – but it applies to teams that are in the Canadians' position in the sense that, you know, you're not, you're not getting blown out every night. You're competitive, but you are losing more often than you win. But there's, there's, there's signs of something happening, you know. Like I think the emergence of Nick Suzuki – particularly since yeah. the All-Star break. He's one of the top scorers in the league since the All-Star break. You know, when you say he's not Pedersen, I agree with you, but I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that he takes another step similar to the one he took this year, next year, and mm-hmm. gets into that sort of 90-point that, that range, which we thought, frankly, coming into the year was probably unattainable for him. Well, I don't think that anymore, personally. Um, Cole Caulfield's not going to shoot 7%. Next year, I'm pretty confident in saying that. Uh, mm-hmm. Slaff is Slaff's got just a ton of momentum coming out of this year. No matter how he finishes the season, is going to enter next year a confident young player, knowing who he is in the NHL with an identity and like. So there's and Caden Gooley. I mean, Dom Lucician put something out today. Like he's he's played. I think he was fifth or sixth toughest minutes in the NHL this season at 22, and he's he's learned a lot and he's and he's really coming into his own as as a as an, a significant piece on the blue line. Um, so listen, it's, it's, yes, the Canadians don't have the pieces that the Canucks do, but they have pieces and they have, I think yep. a lot of the pieces look better than frankly, I thought that they would look this year. And so it's not, it's not as far fetched in my opinion to think for the Canadians to think rather, because I don't, but for them, if they were to think, Hey, why not us next year? And even if their management thought that, that's the only reason I'm bringing it up is that I don't think it would be totally crazy because I do remember the reaction to the Philip Ronick trade, particularly in this city. I thought this city was going to sink into the ocean after that trade because it just made no sense from a from a team building well, no, standpoint. They, they had just acquired that first round pick in in the Bo Horvat deal, exactly, and they and they turn around five weeks after and, and they go it. get a defenseman. Yeah. <laughs> they flip it. Yeah, that's it. so uh, it, was, it certainly was surprising. Yeah. So um, what? Wh- yeah, you can. F- well, because I think it. you're in. Well, no, you're in Belleville right now, and yeah. uh, you're obviously there for Reinbacher's debut, right? And so, um, which got me thinking. Uh, in the last two days, I have spoken to Jaden Struble, Jordan Harris, Arbor Jackai, Mike Matheson. Um, about and I remember I spoke to Logan Mayu about this earlier this season, but just about how the Canadians only have six spots on defense next season. <laughs> they can only play six. Last I heard, they will only play six defensemen, and there are anywhere from eight to twelve defensemen who could arrive in camp thinking, mm-hmm. "I'm going to try and get a job here," and so. What do you think, like Jordan Harris told me that at the trade deadline, he wasn't all that worried, but then all of a sudden he got a text message from his uncle. His uncle was like, hey, man, are you getting traded today? And all of a sudden he's like, well, am I getting traded today? I don't know. It's like, it's, you know, <laughs> he didn't ultimately, but, um, but, you know, just having this in the back of your minds, like, you know, like how, who is part of this core of on defense going forward and who isn't, and when do they have to make those calls? And when we're talking about a busy off season, I think I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it is is getting value for some of the defensemen that they don't think will necessarily be part of this group moving forward, uh, mm-hmm. and creating some room in the lineup for some young guys. I mean, I think Reinbacher is candidate number one. I don't I don't know that he would necessarily start the season in Montreal, but I think they would like to have the possibility of having him play in Montreal at some point if he shows wor- he's worthy of it in Laval. So I don't know what do you what do you think about that? Because I've long thought that they shouldn't rush it. Uh, and I still don't think that, but I do think that some of it's coming to a head where they kind of don't, they're going to have to make some decisions maybe sooner than they would want to. Yeah. Well, when, when you have a GM that keeps mentioning that he's looking to accelerate things, uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't mix well with this idea that you must 
be extremely patient with your young defensemen in order to assess exactly what you've got in each and all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, it's, it's very tricky because for each player, it seems as though there's a tipping point where if you're not sure, you better move the guy before he loses his value. Mm-hmm. And so you have, you have a window that sure, if you keep, Keep the player. Maybe he'll he'll blossom and he'll turn out fine. That's great. But there are other players that, you know, Justin Barron, for example, he's a f- former first round pick. Was traded for for Arturi Lekanen when when the, the 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 Colorado Avalanche traded him. They thought we need Lekanen now. This is the price that we're going to pay. Two years later, you can you already feel like. The, the veneer of the first round, former first round pick, uh, uh, as, you know, as, uh, shaved off from, from the shine is coming off. Yeah. The shine has come off yes. exactly from, from Baron. So it doesn't mean that he doesn't have like still very good NHL potential. Maybe he could be a second pairing defenseman down the road. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But how long is the Canadian, are the Canadians going to wait until they say, okay, he's a, he's a trade chip. And we're going to try to get max value for him. They could wait two more years in the hope that he becomes that top four defenseman. And if he doesn't, well, his value is gone. Jordan Harris could be the same thing too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got, he's, he's a very, I think he's a very interesting player. And for all that's been said about the fact that he doesn't have like a clear dimension and, and that's not, he's got, he's got elite skating ability. But the, where do you put him exactly in which situation where he's really going to be impactful for your team? Yeah, it might not be super clear, but I think that we've, we've tend to, uh, we sort of sold him short a little bit by talking about him uh, the way we talked about him over the, the course of the season. Mm-hmm. But he's in this, that same situation where you have to make a decision sooner rather than later. Otherwise, if that's the guy that you consider that he's the young man out, You might, uh, you might trade him for, for not much if you wait too long. So to me, that's, that's an, that's an, that's one issue. And the other issue, and I'll be quick on that, is that the Canadians have a ton of young defensemen. But I think that the, as much as we say that they're going to need more firepower up front, I think that if they were looking, especially on the, uh, on the free agent market to add, a very solid experienced defenseman to make sure that they, a guy that would be not just an older brother, not just a, a mentor, but a guy that could really have an impact for four, five, six years. I think it could be very beneficial. And I'm looking at you, Brett Pesci. Mm. To me, yeah. if he doesn't sign with Car- Carolina, he's exactly the sort of guy that the Canadians could use, spend money on that guy and say, okay, he's going to, he's going to be a surefire top four guy, stabilize the Canadians play both sides of the ice and really be, really make sure that the Canadians just not only rely on their young defensemen to make sure that everything goes well. At some point you need to surround them. You need to allow some room for the fact that some of those guys won't pan out because they never all pan out. And you need, you'll still need a balance before uh, between veterans and youngsters. So they have very good youngsters, but I think that they would, they would be wise to make sure that they have the proper veteran you see, to complement that group. Yeah. And, and, but that's, it's a bit counterintuitive. And so I think because of what we're talking about, right, we're talking about, I mean, if you had a defenseman that plays on the right side, like I'm presuming that this means they have David Savard has been traded. I would imagine. I mean, it's it's well, be, it, it means it means it's not for the year defenseman. after. Yeah. Um, it it's it's you have already in Laval, like the Rocket in Belleville, or what they're going to line up. Mayu, Baron, and Rhinebacker on the right hand side. Mm-hmm. So that right there could be the Canadians' right side for years. It could be. It could. It and, and if you bring Pesci in, I just I feel like 
I feel like the only way you bring Pesci in is if Savard gets traded at the draft. And then you have to know that you're going to be able to sign Pesci in for agency. Yeah, but you can you can start you can start the year with Salah and and trade him at the at the deadline. You can finish his contract for all I care. Because you don't the, all it means is that you don't rush any of Rhinebacker, Mayu or Barrett for next year and make sure yeah, that eventually they all all three yeah, of them signing, become your right you're side. You're signing a long-term deal. It's it's mm-hmm. it's, it's it just it seems it seems counterintuitive. When you have so many defensemen and you're going to plug a hole with a veteran who's, yes, could be effective, but he's going to make a lot of money. It's going to be mm-hmm. on a long-term contract. It just doesn't seem – it just. Does, but, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think it's interesting, but it's it doesn't seem to be uh, – I mean, the beauty of that – let me just think this through because, I mean, I haven't really, I haven't really considered it, but if you sign Pesci to a six-year deal, I want to see. Yeah. He's – What is he? He's in his age 29. So yeah, he's 29. He's 30 ish. He'll be 30 by the time he's a free agent. And yeah, when's his birthday? Yeah, he's, he's turning 30 in November. He's turning 30 in November. So he's basically, he'll be 30 when you sign him. So if yeah. you sign to a six year deal, you sign to age 36, which I think he could, he could be effective that long. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be outside, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's going to get a big raise off the four point, the four million essentially that he's making now. Uh, It's not crazy, but it is like, I mean, my kind of, my thing in this whole thing is like, if you're Jonathan Kovacevic and you see what's lining up in Laval right now, like you can't feel all that secure, you know? And it's like, it's, and, and for the Canadians, they got, they got to love what's lining up in Laval right now. Like it's, it's, they're like, wow, that would be, that would look good in the NHL level in two years. So, yes, I agree with you that Pesci would prevent them from rushing a Reinbach or whatever, but, I mean, there's nothing stopping them from signing some other right shot D that would be a much more temporary placeholder sure. um, to do that same thing. That's true, but that's if they want to get better, if they want to be really get somebody impactful up front, they might have to, to trade one of their better defensive uh, prospects. Mm-hmm. You know, they could, they could trade Mayu. Yeah. I don't think you know. It's not. I don't think that Harris is going to be provide you the solution with the guy you need on your second line left wing. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. So, and I think that uh, I think that's what so, the that's kind of the discourse around this whole thing is that is figuring out you know what is the best course of action. But what I find interesting is that the guys like the guys that are there now. Mm-hmm. How do you grapple with that mentally? You know, I mean, what do you, what's, cause it's, this is also your career. And, you know, I mean, what's, what's interesting to me about Harris and Struble in particular is that both of them had the option to sign elsewhere. Both of them had the option to wait and sign as free agents coming out of college. And they both, knowing the landscape, knowing how many prospects there were in the Canadian system, both decided to sign with Montreal. Now, Kent Hughes being here had a lot to do with that. I think Struble had a relationship with Adam Nicholas. Uh, Harris had a bit of one as well. It's it's a lot of the elements there uh, helped with that, but it's just I found it super interesting that they willingly went into this competition saying, "Well, I'm going to get my, I'm going to get that spot." And Harris made an interesting point. He's like, "It's like it's not as if this is the first time we've ever experienced something like this. When you're playing prep hockey, you're looking at who they're recruiting. You're looking at who's coming in." You're, you know, the freshman every year, like, who are they going to take my ice time? Then you get to college, same deal. Every year there's a recruiting class. You have to fight for your ice time. And then they're like, listen, we play in the best league in the world. Everyone is, everyone wants to play in the league we're playing in. It's natural that our, if we have a spot in that league, that it's going to be targeted. Like people are coming after it and it's up to mm-hmm. us to maintain it. And, and Jack, I made the point, you know, everyone says in the first half of your career, you got to prove you belong in the NHL. The second half of your career, you have to prove that you still belong in the NHL. So it's always a constant, a constant proof. But to me, the challenge here for the Canadians is identifying which guys to keep and which guys not to keep. And, and it's, it's tough because it's, it's hard. It <laughs> and like, and, and what, what you said about Harris, I think is bang on. Like it's, it's not Jordan Harris is not going to go. It's not going to bring in the young player that you need. However, Jordan Harris plus, the Jets pick 
plus a second round pick plus this plus that like it could be the basis of a package uh that could be considered interesting by a rebuilding team that's looking for multiple assets and 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 maybe say isn't interested in a second round pick or a third round pick but would take a Jordan Harris who's a proven NHL defenseman and is young and 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 is under team control um as part of a package instead of a pick or instead of even a prospect who's not in the NHL yet. Um, right. It's kind of interesting in that way that it's, he's less of a lottery ticket. And even Struble's proven to be less of a lottery ticket. And, and Kovacevic is older, so he's not in the same category. But I think even Mayu this year has proven to be less of a lottery ticket. Like, I don't think there's any real doubt that Logan Mayu is going to have an NHL career. Like, no, he's going to play in the NHL at some point, you know, and, and he's worked on some of his weaknesses, but, but when I look at that right side in Laval, if I were the Canadians, I would be like, that right side in Montreal two years from now would, would be pretty good. So yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a big decision uh, on the blue line. I think that uh, it they might have to commit themselves this this summer, or maybe they're they're going to try to buy time and wait another year before they do that and just use those first round picks. Uh, to improve themselves in the meantime, but it's it's a nice problem to have. Mm-hmm. My my point was just that with all that horde of very promising defensemen, and most of them look like they're going to be future NHLers. Um, I, I would just feel more secure if you had like a, a a bona fide veteran defenseman, especially once Savard has gone to uh, you know to 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 lead that group or to. Uh, to acclimatize those young defensemen, mm-hmm. maybe help Gooley switch to the left side again. Who knows? But there's plenty of guys to uh, to choose from. Uh, earlier on, you were talking about also the guys that were improving up front, uh, Suzuki, Slavkovsky, Caulfield, etc. Um, I think Alex Newhook is an interesting case too because um, – When it, it's okay to say we're going to use some some ammunition uh, from our, our draft capital to to acquire some players. It's, they did it with Doc. They, again, they did it with Newhook. Um, but I think that it's going to be interesting to see if, at the end of the day, the Canadians will have had a good bang for their buck okay. uh, by trading those two to uh, well, they're a late first and uh, you know an early second round pick for Newhook. Uh, who I think projects as a, a as a winger a lot more than a center, but his second stint as centerman is going much better now than his first stint earlier in the season. So I think that that in itself is encouraging. Um, you know, before we recorded, we were chatting about uh, New Hook, you and I, and we we're men- pointing out the fact that. Uh, Out of the blue, almost it seems as though his faceoff numbers have increased yeah, he's, dramatically. He's, That's pretty good. He's a fifty percent faceoff guy since he got back from injury, more or less. I mean, it's yeah, it's pretty impressive. That's, yeah, it is. It is. So I still feel like Armia has been more the driver on that line than he has been, uh, and Hua until his his injury was also very effective. It, it was it made for uh, you know a makeshift second line that was surprisingly effective but even though he has not necessarily been like the key cog on that line i think that he's shown some interesting progress but i just wonder if once the canadians are good enough and are competitive is he going to be a top six guy is he going to be the center of the third line is he going to be a winger on the third line and i feel like ultimately the the place that he occupies on the depth chart in two or three years will tell us if the Canadians spent too much to acquire him or no matter, or maybe you, you, you might, you might disagree with that and say, well, wherever he ends up is going to be a good trade for the Canadians. Where, where do you, where do you stand on that? Well, the way I look at it is when the Canadians acquired new hook, I believe that their intention was to have Alex Newhook play on the wing with Cole Caulfield and Nick Suzuki. That's why they, that's when they went out and got him, that's what they wanted him for. Um, you know, Kirby Doc was obviously going to center the second line. They didn't know what Slavkovsky was going to be. 
they they really didn't know what the second line was going to look like at all. I mean, aside mm-hmm. from five, aside from Doc. Uh, so obviously, Doc going down and Dvorak not being available to start the season forced Newhook to center. Um, and when he returned, uh, Dvorak again being gone <laughs> and uh, and Doc still being gone also forced him to center. But I do think that to me, the way that Slavkovsky and Doc began the season in training camp together, showing excellent chemistry, spending all of training camp together. Um, and really Doc's injury sort of triggered a little bit. Uh, Slavkovsky starting to look really lost, you know, like it's, it's what, what really was striking about how, how lost he looked at the start of the season was how good he looked in training camp. And, and a big part of that was the chemistry he was going with Doc. And I talked to him about a, a few weeks ago and he was like, I just, I can't wait to play with that guy again. Like, I mean, this is while he was playing with oh, yeah. Suzuki and Caulfield. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if the Canadians have shared their plans with him, but I, I, it makes sense to me that mm. Suzuki and Caulfield are a duo. If you have Doc and Slavkowski as a duo, that's two thirds of a massive skilled forward line. Um, Newhook would slide in on either of those lines on the wing as a really good complementary piece. I mean, the things that have, that have impressed me about Newhook are his motor, which was, which was well known. Um, he's, he's better without the puck than I think was advertised on his way in. And he showed a little bit of that in Colorado, but he's, he's, he's good at hounding for pucks. He's really good good. for a checker. He's a good fortune. He's really good at using his body to separate opponents from the puck. And, and he's, he's a thick guy. He's strong. He's not the biggest guy Mm -hmm. in the world, but he has attributes that I think would go well with Suzuki and Caulfield on the wing. So, um, I don't think the price was too high for him. I mean, it, honestly, like it's it's he's 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 a very he's a young forward. You know, he's twenty three years old. He's not. He's he's really just scratching the surface of, the, of his NHL career. Um, like Doc and like Caulfield was drafted right here in the city I'm in in twenty nineteen in Vancouver in the first round. Um, I think they have a real piece there. I mean, I really do. It's it's he's. It, it, uh, and I think they have a top six piece to answer your question. I mean, to like the, the third line thing is, is fair. And listen, if you got Alex Newhook on your third line, then your team's pretty darn good. You know, you look at, you're in a yeah. good situation. And, and the other guy that, you know, Joshua, Roy, like, so he got hurt. Like that was, that was a guy that looked like a future top six piece as well. So it's, you know, we were wondering who was going to fill out the top six. Um, I think those two guys, like you go, some combination of Suzuki, Caulfield, Newhook, Gua, Slav, Doc as a top six. It's not the sexiest one, but I think that Gua showed a lot of promise. He's and considering where he's at in his career, I think he has potential to to fill out a top six role on this team. Um, and if if that's what it winds up being, then then all your prospects really what you need them to do is fill out your bottom six. And that's about that's a lot easier to do. But I mean, I think yeah. both Juan and Newhook are candidates to play on a third line. That would be really good if they were on a third line. But um, well, you're looking to you're looking to build a Stanley Cup contender, right? So yeah, it's, well, it's got think, to be. I think Juan, Juan at age 24 is going to be a hell of an NHL forward. I think. Like I really yeah. do. Like four yeah. years from now, man. I think he's, he's only be really 20 good. years old. <laughs> that's great. I'm, I, I Fifth round pick, 20 that. years old. I love it. It's uh, it's really nice to see how. Uh, how quickly he develop he's a nice surprise you know I, we we were we were saying in the past how it was important that the canadians found like hit a home run with one of their later picks i think they hit one with with joshua Roy, finally yeah. a little thing on joshua Roy, actually just quickly uh, i remember last year around this time of year the canadians were in philadelphia and i asked harvey pinard was playing with suzuki I think Ulanen, but he was in the midst of his of his heater where everything he touched went in the net. Um, yeah. And I asked to talk to Alex Burroughs because I thought that, like, Burroughs is the ultimate complimentary player, you know? He's got a really goofy-looking picture in the Ring of Honor at Rogers Arena. <laughs> and uh, kind of it's kind of eerie when you're in there and he's kind of smiling and he's sort of – it's like the Mona Lisa. It always seems like he's kind of looking at you. Like, and so it's – but anyhow – um, I, de- I asked to talk to him a year ago about Harvey Pinard, about him being a complimentary player, the way Burroughs was so brilliantly for so long in Vancouver. And he said, yeah, 100%. He has those qualities. He has the mind for it. He has the ability to adjust to his line mates. 
And Burroughs was saying much the same thing yesterday. He spoke after practice here in Vancouver about Raphael Harvey Pinard. He's a big fan because I think he sees a lot of himself yeah. in Harvey Pinard. Uh, but really, Hua has all those qualities as well. Like the complementary player qualities. Like it's hard in a tournament environment to suddenly start playing with the best player in the world for his age group in Connor Bernard and just click immediately with the guy. Like that takes, yeah. that takes a certain amount of skill and talent. There's a talent, there's a knack for that. That's a, that's a skill. Uh, Joshua Hua has that skill. Like how good was that new hook army of Hua line looking? And it was never with Hua being the primary player. He just made little plays that, that, that made that line continue playing in the offensive zone or made it go to a certain extent without being a driver. Um, so you need guys like that with your talented mm. players. And so it's, it's, uh, and you know, obviously he's gone now, unfortunately for him and for the Laval rocket, um, he's not going to probably not going to be available for a while, but, um, I think he's a legitimate future top six and it's not just by default. I think he's, he's a really talented player and, and it's got an incredibly strong head for the game that's gonna that's gonna serve him well. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's switch to. Is it, we, we've talked a lot about the youngsters, but let's go even younger, and even uh, guys that are you know. We'll t let's talk about someone who's not on the roster yet. It's time for Future Friday. Future Friday. So yeah, so not discussed in our in our segment on all the young D coming uh, is defenseman Adam Engstrom. The reason why is that he is currently in the SHL playoffs with Rogla. Um, they are facing uh, Faryastad in the quarterfinals of the SHL playoffs. Uh, Rogla is up one nothing. I believe they play tonight, Friday night. Um, uh, game two, rather, is tonight. And so whenever Rogla is eliminated from the playoffs, if indeed they are. I think the Canadians have a lot of interest in bringing Adam Engstrom to Montreal um, as soon as they can. And yeah. worst case scenario, obviously, it would be next year, but the Canadians have every intention of signing him to a contract once this season is over. Whether he comes over this season or next season, that's something else. But he should be in Laval. Uh, left shot defenseman who has shown a lot of promise. Third round draft pick. So I spoke to... Um, The Abbott brothers <clears throat> were the coach and GM in Rogla uh, until they got fired in uh, December. Uh, Chris Abbott was the former general manager. So I had a chance to chat with him uh, the other day when I was in Calgary. No, Edmonton. Um, about Adam Engstrom and just, you know, what the process was for him to. And, and he said that. When he was GM in Rogla, he tried to identify players that were likely to be NHL draft picks, especially defensemen, and bring them into Rogla and 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 build a brand in Rogla, which I think he's done quite he did quite successfully before he got let go, obviously, of Rogla being sort of a factory for developing NHL defensemen, um, Swedish Swedish defensemen to go to the NHL. So. Okay. Engstrom is, you know, William Valinder was, I mean, there's, there's a lot more, Mo Sider was at Rogla. Like there's a lot of, there's a long list of guys who have gone through Rogla and really succeeded. And so Adam Engstrom's the latest one. In. And what Chris Abbott told me is that, you know, the big thing with, with players in Sweden or in Europe, Emil Heinemann was another case like this, is that some, some guys, most of the time, the adjustment is difficult to get from the big ice to the small ice. Um, but some guys, and they're rare, their game is better suited to the small ice. Like they're, they're succeeding in Europe despite the big ice, not because of the big ice. Heinemann was one of those guys um, whose game is just more suited to the close quarters, the physical nature of the, of the North American game. And Abbott thinks that, uh, that Engstrom could be one of those guys that he will actually benefit from, from playing, but he will need to make some improvements on the defensive side of things. It's, it's, it's not quite at an NHL or North American professional level. Um, but the offensive instincts, the ability to play in close quarters, um, quick decision making with the puck, his ability yeah. to break out, all those things trans, he thinks translate well from the big ice to the small ice. And so, 
if as far as the Canadians are concerned, like they're hoping to be able to see that very soon. And and again, this might be another wild card to throw in JF Hool's sort of hand in Laval if if ever this this series were to end quickly. Um they would want to get out Adam Engstrom from over to Laval and, and, you know, it could end. I mean, April 1st is kind of the day that game seven is slated in that series. So, you know, and obviously if Rogla moves on, then, then this season is kind of, you can forget about this season more or less, but it's, it's definitely a possibility. And this is, this is really, as far as the Canadians defense group is concerned, like, I don't know how many people are, are properly, slotting Engstrom in that hierarchy, but I think the Canadians have him pretty high. I think they're pretty high on this guy. Yeah. They uh I think when he was drafted he was still so raw mm-hmm. that um it, it could it could prove to be a bargain that they found him in the third round. Uh he's a you mentioned the you know the um Chris Habit described him well, but the way that he carries the puck up the ice with so much poise, uh he's he's Sometimes he holds on to the puck a bit too much, and he'll try to dangle. They, he, he, he earned the nickname Showtime in Rogle <laughs> for, be- for better or for worse. Uh, so it can be it can be great, but if he's Showtime, mm-hmm. you know, only a handful of times in a game, that's okay. But if he tries to, uh, you know, dangle his way out of trouble too often, then it might catch up to him. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a there's a process. There has been a process throughout the season to simplify his game a little bit, make sure that he remains aware in his an, in his own end, and just pick his spots to to showcase his skills. But the skills are there. Mm-hmm. I th- he's got a good frame too. He's not necessarily the biggest when you um, when you look just at, at on, on paper, but when you look on the ice, he's got he's got a good frame to him. You know, he's uh, and he. Um, It, 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 I think it's going to stand out even more, as you said, on the uh, on the small ice, mm-hmm. on the on the big ice. You know, sometimes you can you can you can be big, but you it doesn't it doesn't cover as much ice because it's so big. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm really looking forward to see uh, what what he's going to do. Uh, it's been paired with Brendan Davidson a lot. You remember? Brendan I remember Brendan Davidson. Davidson. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So soft spoken. Very kind kid, uh, and now he's the, just the, struggled. The veteran just president. struggled mightily. <laughs> Every minute he was in Montreal was difficult yeah. for Brendan Davidson. Poor guy, but yeah, yeah. Well, that's what. That's why he's he's in Sweden he's playing in Sweden yes. now. <laughs> well, good for him. You know, you can have a good life over there. It's uh, it's a good living to be made in Europe. But yeah, this is Engstrom is another guy that's going to add to that group and just create that additional tension on every yeah. defenseman in the organization that they need to be at their best at all times. And I think ultimately for the Canadians, this situation is great. It's just for the individual components of that organizational strength, it can be stressful. And so let's see what happens. I mean, if Rogla gets knocked out uh, early, that's, mm. it would be, it would be a very interesting ad for Laval. And, and, and even when you look at just adding Reinbacher creates that unease, right? You know, there are some guys uh, who have been... Norlander looks like a scratch for, for Friday Well, that's night, right. But so. I think it's easier to scratch a Norlander after the type of season he's had than if you bring in an Engstrom and the organization says, we want to see this guy, and all of a sudden you have to go to, to Bissell and be like, yeah, sorry, man. <laughs> Or someone... Yeah. You know, or like just someone who's been there all year and has been in the trenches and has fought and a veteran presence and everything that they got those guys bring and say, sorry, we got to play this kid at the most important time of the year. You know, like it's, it's tough. Yeah. It's a tough thing to handle. And so that's, that's, but that's your job as an AHL coach. And that's your job as an AHL veteran. You just got to live with that stuff. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's just, it's reality of their situation. So Engstrom would be – so you got on the left side, Gouli. Well, Engstrom plays on the right, I believe, in Sweden as a lefty, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, what, with Davidson, Davidson's been playing on the left yeah. and, and Engstrom on the right. So that's a nice thing to have. That's really that's really good for his toolkit and his, his yeah. calling card, mm-hmm. being able to play both sides. Uh, but I'll assume that they would switch him back on I the left. I think they would, yeah. For, yeah. So you would have Gouli – Uh, Jack Eye, Struble, Harris, Hudson, mm-hmm. and Engstrom. 
So that's just the left side. That's just so when the we left were talking side, to yeah. Them, s- uh, how are they going to do this? You know, well, something those gonna, guys something's got to give. Something's got. Well, a yeah, not all of them are going to hit, and b uh, something's just going to have to give. And like I was saying today, and like I think Harris brought up, uh, you know, Jake Allen knew all year he was going to get traded. He was pretty sure all year. And but he's a veteran yeah. guy. You know, it's like it's easy for him to handle that. He just he looked at the situation. He's like something has to give, and it did eventually. Something here is going to have to give. And so Engstrom is another, and Reinbacher, as of tonight in Belleville, is added to that mix. Engstrom could be added to that mix in the coming days or weeks. Um, you know, I was asking Mike Matheson about what training camp will be like with all these defensemen in camp next year. I didn't even finish the question. I said, training camp's just going to be, and he said, wild. <laughs> he completed my <laughs> sentence. He said, it's going to be wild. So we will see. Um, I love that. Yeah, I love that. Well, let's let's start by finishing that season. Uh, yeah. So uh, okay, you're dismissed, Mr. Best. I got to go to the game, and uh, hopefully, I will be home uh, tomorrow after or this afternoon, I guess Friday. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back on Monday uh, with our mailbag. So remember, if you have mailbag questions, and we've already received a bunch, but. You can always send them to Basu and Good Day at gmail.com or on X at Basu and Good Day. And Marco Antoine, have a nice weekend in Belleville. I got the Enjoy lucky Enjoy Belleville, <laughs> and I will be hopefully leaving Vancouver in the morning. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you Monday.